Watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome to Mark Dolan Tonight. In my big opinion, the new law that allows employees to sue their bosses if they get offended at work. Well, this insane policy offends me deeply. In the big story, as he confirms he will not attend the King's coronation, does Joe Biden hate the UK? We'll be talking to Paul Burrell, Diana's former butler, exclusively on Mark Dolan Tonight. And my Mark Meets guest is the legendary Guardian columnist Polly Toynbee. Is a Labour government now inevitable? Big guests, big stories and big opinions. A lively two hours to come, but first the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Let's get you up to date with the latest from the GB newsroom. The Home Secretary has singled out British Pakistani men over concerns about grooming gangs as she prepares to announce new measures to tackle child sexual abuse. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Suella Braverman says authorities have turned a blind eye over fears of being labelled racist or bigoted. She's pledged to put people working with children in England under a new legal duty to report signs of suspicious or uh, signs or suspicions of sexual abuse. Safeguarding Minister Sarah Dine says it's a scourge of our society. We can't stop in making sure that people are protected. Children are the most vulnerable part of our society as well as the elderly. We must make sure that they're not sexually abused. So I don't accept we're going to be rife with false reports. There may be one or two and they will be dealt with and identified. The overwhelming people that gave evidence are speaking the truth to the inquiry and it was very heartbreaking testimony. We need to act. The Port of Dover says it's working to clear the backlog of coaches that are trying to cross the English Channel as soon as possible. Passengers have once again faced long delays of up to eight hours. It's understood all coaches have now finally reached the port, but Easter holidaymakers are still facing further hours of waiting to have their passports checked. Port officials have blamed delays on a lengthy immigration process, but Suella Braverman has rejected suggestions that Brexit's responsible. The families of two British men being detained in Afghanistan say they are being treated fairly, having spoken to them in what they've described as an unscripted emotional call. A spokesman for two of the men being held, that's Kevin Cornwell and a second unnamed man, says it represents tremendous progress. They've been in custody since January. It's unclear, though, how long the third man, the so-called danger 
tourist Miles Rutledge has been held. The government says it's in negotiations regarding their safety. At least one person's been killed and 25 others injured in an explosion at a cafe in Russia's second city, St. Petersburg. State-owned news agencies report 19 people uh, are in hospital at the moment. The prominent pro-Russian military blogger Vladlin Tatarsky is confirmed to have died. He's a vocal supporter of Russia's war in Ukraine. A local news website has reported the cafe targeted was once owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of Russia's Wagner Group, a notorious private army of mercenaries fighting in Ukraine. No one has yet claimed responsibility. 29 people are now known to have died after a series of tornadoes swept through the United States. Officials say more than 40 reports were made across seven states in the south and midwest of the country on Friday night. Homes have been destroyed and cars flipped over and crushed. An entire school in Arkansas was ripped apart with students and teachers saying they're grateful not to have been inside. The President, Joe Biden, has declared a major disaster in that state and has ordered federal support to help with the recovery. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn2, this is GB News. Now, it's back to Mark. My thanks to Aaron Armstrong, who's back in an hour's time. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, the bonkers new law, which will allow employees to sue their bosses if somebody offends them at work. Well, this insane policy offends me deeply. In the big story, as he confirms he will not attend the King's coronation, does Joe Biden hate Britain? I'll be asking Princess Diana's former butler, Paul Burrell, live and exclusive in just a few moments. Is a Labour government now inevitable? And has Sakir Starmer finally worked out what a woman is? I'll put that to my Mark Meets guest, legendary Guardian journalist Polly Toynbee, live in the studio. In my take at 10, the move to a cashless society is a direct assault on people power. I'm not having it. Cash is king. Is the bumper new trans-Pacific trade deal a game changer for Britain? And are those delays in Dover really down to Brexit? I'll be asking Anne Widdicombe, who is tonight's newsmaker. Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers, with tomorrow's front pages at exactly 10.30. With three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, historian and political commentator David Oldroyd Bolt, journalist and political consultant Emma Burnell, and former Conservative MP and farmer Neil Parrish. He'll be talking bullocks. Now, I'll be asking my top pundits later in the hour, with the literary classic Gone with the Wind set to include trigger warnings, is it wrong to censor works of the past? Are Suella Braverman's policies racist? And are you addicted to the internet? We'll discuss all of that, plus your emails, especially the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. This show has a golden rule. We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come. Let me tell you, I've got a big cup of coffee here. Look at that. Mmm, beautiful. Nescafe Gold Blend. It's all in the beans. A big show to come. Let's start with my big opinion. Welcome to hell. The Telegraph newspaper report that new harassment rules on the edge of becoming law will enable medics to sue the NHS if a patient insults them. It will allow bar staff to take legal action against landlords if they're offended by a drunk punter. And it will allow baristas to, in a coffee shop, take the owners to a tribunal if they overhear offensive remarks made by customers. Well, this madness offends me deeply. This story comes hot off the heels of a report in the Sun newspaper in February, suggesting pub bosses are now so worried about this new law, they could have to hire banter bouncers to police boozy chats under proposed laws. Rules to protect workers from being harassed may give them the right to sue if jokes or comments they hear offend them. An update to the Equalities Act aims to stop people getting abused at work. They would argue workers have no choice but to go to work and therefore they need and deserve protection from hateful conduct 
by patrons. Rubbish. All this does is pile extra rules, costs and bureaucracy onto bosses who will have to become agents of state censorship. Ultimately, it will leave punters in the pub, unable to shout at the telly or crack a naughty joke, without putting landlords at risk of being sued by upset staff. It sounds made up, doesn't it? But it's real. The government overplayed their hand during the pandemic, micromanaging our lives and even deciding our movements. Well, now they want to micromanage what we think and what we say. It all represents what George Orwell famously described as the thought police, creating a grim dystopia so censorious it would have the North Koreans blushing. Cancel culture has reached its nadir when you can't make an edgy remark in a public setting without having your collar felt. The United Kingdom, supposedly the home of liberal democracy and free speech, has completely lost its way with this mad new legislation. The idea that this won't lead to a flurry of long and excruciating tribunals and court cases is naive at best. There are scores of fragile snowflakes who will seize upon their right not to be offended and who will happily drag their employers through the courts for a remark that they may have heard, that they didn't like, which wasn't even aimed at them. When is this madness going to end? In Scotland, the SNP's delightful new shit-stirrer, sorry, leader, Humza Yousaf, drafted so-called hate crime legislation in Scotland, which opened the door to your possible arrest for saying something offensive at home in the privacy of your own four walls. Well, in England and Wales, we now face that same threat in a hospital setting, in our local boozer, or even when we're chugging a latte in Starbucks or Costa. The government must think again. It's time to wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, welcome back to the show. Reacting to the big stories of the day, we've got my brilliant pundits. But let me ask you, is this legislation necessary to get on top of hateful language and to protect all groups in our community, particularly when they're in a place of work where they should be safe? Maybe Humza Yousaf is right to prosecute hateful language at home, where, of course, you will hear plenty of it. Is that how you stamp it out? That's not my view, but what's yours? Mark at gbnews.uk. Let's get the views now of historian and political commentator David Aldroyd Bolt. Journalist and political consultant Emma Burnell and former Conservative MP and now farmer Neil Parrish. Emma, let me start with you. Your reaction to this legislation, it needs to be watered down, doesn't it? It needs to be clear and concise, is what I would say. Can I first say that the majority of this legislation is actually about sexual abuse and harassment? And that is really important. You cannot walk away from your workplace. You will lose your job if you do that. And too many people are therefore having to put up with really appalling behaviour from customers and clients because they are too scared to walk away from their job and lose their income. And um, it shouldn't be you know, that, that way round. So there are really important safeguards that we do need to have in the workplace to make sure that people aren't abused. My sense is that what we need to do is set thresholds for this. So I don't believe, I genuinely don't believe, and I don't think that given that the legislation is being steered by free speech champion Kemi Badenoch, um, that we are going to see people prosecuted for shouting wanker at the referee on the telly. I'm sorry for using the word. Well, you, you are encouraged to use it on this <laughs> programme because it's the home of free speech. Uh, but I, I actually, I, I don't think, actually, I, I correct myself, I don't think this should be watered down. It should be completely ditched, this whole policy, this whole legislation, because it's an affront to a free Western society. It doesn't seem like there's a single thing envisaged here that isn't already an offence under some other piece of legislation. And I do find it quite grimly ironic that Rishi Sunak, who ran on a policy of getting rid of work which he said permeates modern life, mm. is allowing this through. It I'm, I'm afraid it confirms what I thought at the time, that he was using that as a line to try and hoover up votes from the Tory faithful that he knew would otherwise uh, go to Liz Truss, and what's a surprise they did. Um, I must disagree with Emma. I don't think that there is anything here that we need that is not already there. If there is sexual harassment in the workplace, that is dealt with. If there is sexual harassment from a customer, that can certainly be dealt with. You 
report them to the police. And that's never been acceptable. No, of course. Well, not for a very, very, very long time indeed. Certainly not within our lifetimes, mm. yeah. uh, working lifetimes. Mm. And it doesn't surprise me in the least that this comes from a Liberal Democrat, neither of who, parts of whose name is in any way apposite to what they mm. are. They are neither Liberal nor Democratic. Anyone who's had anything to do with them in campaigning knows that they are the most vicious of political operators. And for them to try and put this on the statute, which just shows that their viciousness extends to what you say in your own house mm. or pub. Yes, I mean, my concern about this, it, Neil, is that it will provoke a tsunami of court cases and mm. tribunals from a generation of woke snowflakes. That was particularly the point I wanted to make to you, Mark, is that I think, you know, I, I hate things landing up in court, and I'm afraid this is exactly where it'll go. And, you see, I mean, what you can't do as an employee, especially if you're running a pub, if you're, if you're a shopkeeper, um, you really can't control what your, your shoppers and your punters in the pub are going to say. Now, mm. we don't want anything too drastic in there, but why should you, who actually are, are the owner of the pub uh, or owner of the shop, actually be held directly responsible and I think this is what worries me and I think you know it, it, it is it's a lawyer's charter again and do we actually need it and I mean you made the point about Big Brother I mean our, you know we'd be better off having a television up there actually sort of monitoring everything we're saying and doing yeah. aren't we and is that where we're going well the, I mean, it, it's Emma, just you know it just can't yeah. be done you I directly think. benefit from free speech we all do of course on, on I do, this programme. Absolutely. you're a playwright as well and you, you do great comedy <clears throat> um, you could probably get your pub landlord arrested or, or sued, uh, certainly in trouble with his staff, if you just loudly quoted an early stand-up routine from Billy Connolly? I, genuinely, as I say... Because many describe what, what... early Billy Connolly comedy as, as hateful language. Look, I'm a massive, massive Billy Connolly fan. But it's um, naughty, isn't it? It is naughty. And, yeah, I, I genuinely don't think that that is going to be what happens. We are... What, <laughs> what needs to be put in statute? Bad law is bad law, and I agree with both my fellow panellists that this should be... That there should be thresholds that mean that this has to be that has to be reached, so that it can't just be people swearing at each other in a pub if you're a bit of a pearl clutcher and don't like swearing. But there are there is a duty of care to employees well, uh, from employers. You know what? Can't we keep it simple? And, I mean, and let's, if, let's if also re remember that all this law is doing is reducing the number of incidents from three to one. So it's not actually a massive Emma, leap in Emma, the law. Emma, I think that if if let's say somebody goes into a cafe right and and. Um, the, the, the waiter or the waitress brings them their coffee and they say, after you've served that coffee, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to assault you, OK? That is a clear, mm. a clear disgraceful thing. Uh, if, however, uh, the person says, uh, you know, hello, darling, you're gorgeous, or if they tell a rude joke to the person that's having a coffee with them, I think that's an important freedom. Well, A, people, uh, I mean, that low-grade sexual harassment that just happens all the time. Nobody's going to the police but about that. You can't that. legislate against it, can you? I mean, you can. I'm not sure that well, you we always can't should. Well, burglars or rapists. Well, I mean, that's mothers. the other question, uh, which, which is that we don't have any law fit for purpose at the moment, it mm. seems. Um, I would put much more emphasis on dealing with more serious crime. Um, this is... That's in... why we need to bin this legislation. Well, I don't know that we need to bin this legislation. I think we need to think about what this legislation is for, think about it societally and think about it in the workplace. We actually have, at the moment, a big problem that people can't hire. I was talking to someone this morning who had tried to hire for a job in Glasgow and they just didn't get any applicants. Mm. So it may well be that actually uh, employers in enforce this workplace by themselves, by I'm, going to good workplaces. I'm boiling with rage yeah. about this, because who the hell decides what hate speech is? Yeah, and also, I mean, what, what is, you know, what is just banter and what is offensive and who is actually going to decide this as well? And, you know, is this the thing that's actually going to land up in, in a court of law? It'd be crazy. Well, and no, it'll be an autonomous tribunal. tribunal. It, it, it yeah, feeds but the I mean, monster just, of people, just won't entitled work. people, walking around ready to be offended, and now they've got yeah. the law on their side. I'm afraid this comes back to a really misguided phrase in the McPherson report of 1994 that uh, stated that a racist incident was any incident that was perceived to be racist either by the person at whom it was directed or by any other bystander. And I think from that well-meaning colonel, which was, of course, a report into the murder of Stephen Lawrence, has sprung a great deal of, uh, of, of curtain twitching and of people taking offence on other people's behalves. If you are the subject of racist abuse, of sexual yeah, harassment, exactly. of homophobia, of any other sort of abuse, it is on you to go to the police, if necessary, and report it. It's not for other people to go around taking offence on your behalf. And I think it's a really pernicious 
piece of legislation. I think it continues pernicious legislation that's been enshrined by this Conservative government, and I think it should be struck away, and I'm so glad that there are already Conservative ministers coming out and saying, and Conservative uh, peers coming out and saying, that this should not be legislation. There you go. A charter for thin-skinned narcissists. That's my view. What's yours? Mark at gbnews.uk. I think it's a nightmare for employers. I think it's ridiculous that the NHS could get sued. They've already spent enough of our money without having to have court cases and tribunals because a patient just swore because their plaster was ripped off too speedily. Coming up next in the big story with the US president snubbing King Charles's coronation, I'm joined by the top US doctor. We'll discuss his health, but also the former bodyguard to Princess Diana, not bodyguard, by the way, uh, <coughs> butler, let's be clear. I mean, he's, he's beefy, <laughs> but he's not that strong. Uh, the former butler to Princess Diana, of course, it is Paul Burrell. That's next. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on well, you are. You, my you, ringtone. You, no. My political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. A law to protect people from being offended in the workplace. The world's gone mad. Your reaction. Mark, I cannot believe what I'm hearing, says Nadia. It's crazy. How can a boss be held responsible for what someone says? Do the government want to take our brains and put them in a machine that only says and thinks what we're allowed? Stand up, people. I'm as mad as hell. Well, Nadia, thank you for that. Keep those emails coming. Uh, so many uh, strong views on this. How about this from Daryl? Good evening, Daryl. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Daryl says, what on earth has happened to the British backbone? Why have so many people become so easily offended by others having a laugh at what they find funny? Stop being a bunch of snowflakey twats and try to censor free speech in our free country. Toughen yourselves up and get a spine. Daryl, thank you for that. 
Look, uh, you guys don't pull your punches, which is what I love about those emails. Keep them coming. Mark at gbnews.uk. And it's time now for the big story. And last night's big opinion on this show broke the internet. It was in reaction to Joe Biden's announcement that he will not be attending the King's coronation in May. Here's what I had to say. Of the free world, Joe Biden, a man less equipped to perform his duties than a eunuch on his wedding night, has interrupted one of his many daytime naps in order to announce that he will not be attending the King's coronation. The UK, America's closest ally, an economic, military and diplomatic partner on the world stage, will not be honoured with the presence of a man so decrepit he makes the cast of Last of the Summer Wine look positively sprightly. The only advantage of Biden not coming is that at least he won't turn up and forget King Charles's name and call him Princess Diana or something. But this decision by the president and his team is an extraordinary insult to the United Kingdom. Not just my view, but a view supported by the legendary Canadian academic Dr. Jordan Peterson last night, who showed his agreement to his millions of followers with one word, yes. Absolutely, it's an insult. So what is the reason for his absence? Is he really too old to travel those distances or does Joe Biden hate Britain? To debate this, I'm delighted to welcome all the way from Beverly Hills in California, political commentator and a woman known as America's psychiatrist, Dr. Carol Lieberman, and former butler to Diana, Princess of Wales, and I'm a celebrity star, Paul Burrell. Paul, great to have you back on the show. Do you think that Joe <laughs> Biden has a problem with Britain? Mark, um, I'm going to disagree with you because I know that this looks unusual, mm -hmm. but this move does have a precedent. Dwight D. Eisenhower did not attend Queen Elizabeth II's uh, uh, coronation in 1953, um, and Joe Biden is just following suit. He's a head of state. And also, you have to remember that our late Queen did not attend other heads of state's coronations or funerals in Europe, she sent her deputy, who, th who was then uh, our crown prince in effect, uh, the Prince of Wales. And so really it, this it will not affect diplomatic relations between Britain and America. I know the king, I know that he will not be offended personally by this, and he will embrace all of Europe's heads of state when they come to the coronation. I don't really think that he will miss Jill Biden being there, especially as Mrs. Biden might be there in his place. Well, the 1950s were a long time ago, and I would argue, mm -hmm. Dr. Carol Lieberman, that whilst I've never been a cheerleader for Donald Trump, if he was president right now, he'd be going. Yes, Absolutely. This is just one more embarrassment from Biden. I mean, um, you know, it's like holding on for the ride till his term is over, holding on, hoping that there's going to be no other disasters. But, um, you know, his excuse was that he was too old to travel. That was one excuse. Another excuse was that he had a prior engagement. Now, May 6th does happen to be Sigmund Freud's birthday. So maybe he's going to an honorary birthday party for him. I mean, I'm just being facetious. Obviously, this is, this is horrible protocol. You know, with the world, the most serious aspect of this, is that with the world um, turning against us, our enemies, thanks to Biden and thanks to what he did in Afghanistan and thanks to, you know, so that all these enemies, starting with Russia and Ukraine, but, um, you know, going to China and Iran, and all of them, that, you know, this, they're seeing that America is weak. And so you would think that at a time like this, when all our enemies are jumping up to, you know, to take advantage of this weakness, that Biden would want to keep making friends. I mean, it's not just a matter of being at the coronation, although, of course, that's important. But it's also a chance for to talk with, you know, all of the other heads of states that are going to be there. Mm. I mean, look, Paul Borrell, I absolutely take mm. your point about historical precedent, and that will have been very important to you when you served the royal family and Diana, mm. Princess of Wales. Um, however, it would be a great honour to the king if the president were to appear. And that's the mm. point, isn't it? He hasn't taken that opportunity to pay his respects to our new monarch. It's a significant moment. We might only have two coronations this century. And I wonder whether it's something of a diplomatic slight on the British people as well. 
I, I, no, I agree with you in the fact that um, he should be there. I do. And if Donald Trump was still president, yes, he would be there because he admired the royal family. He admired our late queen and he loved the British Constitution. So I agree that he's going to miss out on the show of the decade and he's not going to see that or witness it personally. And that is a great sadness. But I don't I really don't believe that this is going to cause a huge rift between Britain and America. We are strong allies. And, and despite what's said, I, I do honestly think that um, we are great friends and great nations who, who work together, uh, despite who the president is, because the president will change in four years' time. The king won't. And as the queen always said to her prime ministers, um, you might be here for uh, four or maybe eight years. I'm here for the rest of my life. And the king will be there for the rest of his life. And he will see another president, too, in his reign. So presidents come and go. Kings and queens don't. Uh, is the elephant in the room that Joe Biden is too frail to travel? I well, think that could know, possibly be the case, yes. Want, um, people Carol? seeing him fall up or down uh, the steps of Air Force One. But, you know, another part of it is, is it really perhaps that he's being influenced, certainly by Obama and perhaps by, you know, um, Harry and Meghan, this whole idea that, uh, that, he, that Biden is showing his supporters that um, he is also against the monarchy, you know, because because you should be and because of slavery. And I mean, I don't, of course, go along with that. But um, it seems like he might be virtue signaling for his uh, constituents. So you think he's taking sides potentially with Harry and Meghan by not appearing at the coronation? Obama and Obama. Obama oh. is really Obama is the one who pulls his strings um, mm. all together. And so I think this could well be another another um, string pulling by Obama. Uh, briefly, Carol, how long? That's a very think, interesting uh, comment. <laughs> yeah, go, go on, Paul, please respond. That's a very interesting comment to think that the president of the United States would be siding with Harry and Meghan. When the king has sent invitations to Harry and Meghan, he's taken the moral high ground. He's actually given them the chance to say yes or no, whether they come to the coronation. I personally think that Meghan will not come to the coronation. She will stay behind in California to look after the children. I do believe that Harry will come to the coronation to support his family. After all, it makes him relevant because he has to be relevant and attached to the royal family to continue his brand. Because without the brand of being royal, what is there left? Paul, do you think it's appropriate that just Harry attends the coronation or do you think the couple, Harry and Meghan, should be there? What's, what's the right thing to do in your estimation? What is the right thing to do mm -hmm. is to brave it and to show solidarity uh, together and come together. But of course, that's going to be a dreadful experience for both of them, having written this book, Spare, and having said what they've said over the past few years and pushed most of the family members under the bus. So they're going to have to sit and grin and bear it in, in Westminster Abbey at the King's coronation. And I don't think that Meghan's going to do that. I think she's going to find an easy excuse to get out of this by saying, oh, it's Archie's birthday, so I'm going to stay behind in California and have a birthday party rather than go to the coronation. And now I'm going to get in trouble with producer Maria because I've got one more for Carol and then one more for uh, Paul okay. because we have such a high calibre of guest on tonight's show. Uh, Carol, how long do you think Joe Biden can carry on before he keels over? Um, his people are talking about another four years. I do not think he's going to make it for another four years. As I've said on your show, um, he ha and I've been saying even before he, as he was running for president, he has encroaching dementia, and it was a mistake to, to vote him in to begin with. And I just want to say I agree with um, the idea that, if, that Harry and Meghan, if they don't come, that they, will, they won't be relevant anymore. And that's why I think that actually both of them will come. But I think it's really a shame for the king because uh, that will, he, they will take too much attention away from him. Now, Paul, last but not least, can I say you look the picture of health. We always love having you on the show. And I'm really Thank pleased you. that you've got good news in terms of your 
awful cancer diagnosis. Are you able to tell me uh, where you're at with your health? Yes, I'm finished now with my uh, cancer treatment and my radiotherapy. And I'm taking a break on the Welsh coast uh, with my husband. Uh, it's been a roller coaster ride. Uh, I have to wait for six months now to find I'm all clear. But I'm feeling good. But we'll wait and see. Fingers crossed. Uh, you look brilliant. And I think you're, you're feeling well enough uh, to possibly brave another stint in the jungle. Is that right? Ah. Uh, well, you see, it's already recorded. It's in the can. We went last September to South Africa to record I'm a Slave to Get Me Out of Here, Legends. And you will see all those familiar faces doing what they did the first time around. I was in 2004, a very long time ago. Um, I'm an older guy this time, so um, let's see what happens to me this time around. We wish you well in your recovery. We look forward to watching the show. Thanks so much, Paul Burrell. And my deep thanks to America's psychiatrist, the one and only, the inimitable Dr. Carol Lieberman, who, let me tell you, is on Twitter. She's got her own website. Well worth a look. Uh, thank you, folks. Uh, your reaction, please, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Coming up with the pundits, are Suella Braverman's policies racist? Are we addicted to the internet? And is it wrong to censor works of the past? See you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Does Joe Biden hate Britain? Christopher, hi, Mark. Biden turned up late for the Queen's funeral, then moaned about sitting at the back. To the old... Uh, was it? To, oh, I can't make the rest of it out. Um, let's not forget uh, that he was very rude to the Queen. Um, so there you go. OK, he wouldn't know he was there anyway, is what uh, Chris also said. 
Um, jo snubbed an invitation. You do know Her Majesty had no king for a reason. Um, thank you for that. We'll keep those emails coming. Mark at gbnews.uk. Reacting to the big stories of the day, historian and political commentator David Aldroyd Bolt, journalist and political consultant Emma Burnell, and ex-Tory MP and farmer. In fact, he's got quite a few Herefords. It's Neil Parrish. <laughs> got to tell you, he was just... just Last time he was on, he said, I've got, I've got a, a bunch of Herefords. I didn't know if he was talking about cows, pigs, or women. Turns out it was all three. Now, <laughs> Suella Braverman today insisted I mean, Rwanda is a safe place to send migrants. The Home Secretary defended the government's plans to send those who come to Britain illegally on a one-way ticket to the African nation, despite being challenged over a 2018 incident in which... Uh, there's evidence 12 Congolese refugees were shot dead by police when presented with the evidence on the BBC Sunday show with Laura Koonsberg. The Home Secretary said she was not familiar with the case. So with criticism in some quarters of the government's stop the boats strategy, are Suella Braverman's policies racist? David. I don't think they're racist. I think they're slightly odd. Why is it that the Rwandans deserve our cast-offs? And uh, no, these people should be sent back to the countries from which they originated. Uh, slightly odd that the Home Secretary was not aware of the case referred to in Rwanda, as it appears it was actually used in the Home, uh, the Home mm. Office's own briefing document about the problems with this Rwanda strategy. And I think an overriding political problem is that uh, the absolute necessity of controlling our borders and of keeping out illegal immigrants is made to look ridiculous by this scheme and it gives all of the uh, opponents we have uh, who wish to have open borders who don't care a damn about whether or not we have uh, migrants coming over the border legally or illegally uh, can use this as easy ammunition so i think it's politically rather silly it's diplomatically probably not the easiest sell in the world for the rest of the world uh, and uh, it's just not very good common sense so you think the rwanda plan is an own goal by the government yeah. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, what do you think, Neil? Would you have supported it if you were in the Commons still? I think I would begin to struggle with it, actually, because I think it's done... It's one of these things that's done as a deterrent, basically, um, to say to those trying to, you know, pay a fortune to get in a boat and mm. risk their lives coming across, don't do it because you're going to be sent to Rwanda. But I think the problem is that legally, I think it's, it's never probably ever going to happen because I think there's going to be so many court cases um, and I think that's the problem with it. So, therefore, it was done in the, with the best of intentions in some ways um, if you actually want to stop people coming across. But I think, in reality, it's going to be very difficult to Really Emma, think. however, is the Rwanda plan not messaging? And what would you say to the many thousands of people watching or listening to this programme who back the policy? I understand why people want this policy to work. The problem is they're going to be even further let down. And that's not going to make them feel better about either the government's migration policy or the way that we tackle migration as a whole. Mm. Um, I think the, the racism question is a red herring. Um, what the policy is, very deliberately, is cruel. The point is it's deterrent, so you have to make it nasty. To it, You have to make it feel worse to come here than not to. And, and many people listening would say, bring it on. And, and that is their political choice. It's not why I stand. I do not believe in open borders, but, but I do if, believe they, in... What if they don't have a case to be here? Or, if they or don't have a case to be migrants? here, then they should be sent back. But there are places we cannot send people back to, and that, that needs to be dealt with within the structures that we have signed up to in, under international and um, domestic law, and we need to be uh, have a humane but workable policy. The problem with this policy is it's neither, and it will fall down either on if you support its its principles, mm. it falls down on the practicalities, and if you don't support its principles, it falls down on first looking. You see, we can't even repatriate them back to Europe. I mean, we haven't got an agreement to do that. Um, and, and I don't so, think we ever will. I know. And so, therefore, you know, I mean, if... But, you know, I mean, cases, we've seen it on the GB News, of, of six, seven years, and, and people haven't been processed. And so you do actually have to question if a lot of these resources that's put into the Rwanda scheme were actually put in to actually make sure that we can work out whether they should be able to stay or not um, and then not be kept in hotels and what have you, sure. Surely that's got to be right. And I think, you know, this is where the government's going to get itself. It, it, it's a, it's a soundbite, mm. if they're not at all careful, that will come literally.
literally to back to bite them. And that's what I think yeah. will happen. Coming back to uh, things that will back and bite you on the bum, <laughs> uh, Southern Classic Gone with the Wind is to come with a trigger warning amid concerns over its depiction of 19th century flavoury. Margaret, Margaret Mitchell's novel set in Georgia during the American Civil War has been a favourite for generations of book lovers since its publication in 1936. It was memorably brought to the silver screen in 1939, starring Vivian Lee as the Southern Belle Scarlet O'Hara and Clark Gable as Rhett Butler. But publisher Pam McMillan has now decided that readers could find racist aspects of the era hurtful or indeed harmful. So is it wrong to censor works of the past. Is there any problem with a little warning at the beginning of the book, David? No, I think we have to take this uh, in the broad history of literature, and particularly literature from a long time ago, rep representing views that are, uh, let's say, unfashionable, or in some cases, downright offences. There have always been introductions. You can take, you know, go into any bookshop, pick up a work of Aeschylus or Homer or Virgil or anything from, say, Boccaccio from the mm. 15th, 16th century. Uh, they will always come with an introduction that puts in context those things which are, now but are we no longer acceptable. Human however, human however, there idiots. should not be any censorship, of course. Mm. There should be no rewriting, and there, there, we don't need a sticker on the front of the book that says, be careful, this might, might offend you. Actually, it's sometimes rather good for people to be offended and challenged by what they read. It makes them think about how they respond to things now, as well as how they view the past. So this is an introduction that says, you know, this, this was the case in uh, antebellum America. Mm. The, this was the appalling state of slavery. Brilliant. If people start trying to excise passages or stick something on the front saying sort of PG 15, Ch children don't read this, it'll give you nightmares. Okay. Wrong. Brief you see, what, what we can't do is rewrite history, and this seems what we want to do mm. now. And, mm. and therefore, let's actually discuss history, let's discuss these books. And yes, you know, slavery was terrible, we all accept that. But, you know, by, by actually trying to take words out, we don't actually discuss it enough, do we? No. And, and so what are we doing? You know, I think we're not actually helping the situation without actually putting that right. Briefly, Emma? I think it is making it worse. But not they're better. not taking any words out. They're putting some words on the front to contextualise Treating it. us like children, that's the some point. Some children you pick will up, read it. Pick up Good, they you, should. Yeah, they, I'm not saying they shouldn't <laughs> read it. We, I'm never going to read Gone with the Wind. I've watched the film we, twice, we, I loved had, it, but it's too long. But we've but had centuries of books point, without trigger warnings. Why are we so pathetic that we need them now? What's it's, changed? It's just, there's nothing changed, but I would absolutely <laughs> okay. be okay, on yeah. the barricades with you to stop it being censored. That is not this. Well, I don't like the patronising trigger warning. I think it's the thin end of the wedge, but look, Emma's in Entitled to her view, that's why we love having her on the show. What's yours, Mark at GBNews.uk? Coming up next, is a Labour government inevitable now? My Mark Meets guest is the iconic Guardian columnist and journalist Polly Toynbee. Don't go anywhere. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's time now for Mark Meets, and tonight one of the most respected and experienced journalists of her generation, Polly Toynbee, the former social affairs editor of the BBC and current Guardian columnist. She's also a best-selling author, and her latest book, An Uneasy Inheritance, My Family and Other Radicals, Yes, indeed. I think we might have a still of the book, if we can uh, fire that one up. It's out in June. I look forward to discussing it with Polly, uh, an, an, an uneasy inheritance. Uh, Polly Toynbee, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Hello. Uh, we must get to, to the book and, and, and actually your background as a journalist and your life story. But I know you're not delighted with this current government. Do you think a Labour government is now inevitable? Uh, I think almost inevitable. I mean, it could be a government with a huge majority or maybe a government with a small majority that might have to work in f some form of coalition. I think it's inconceivable that this government could get back with a majority to govern. Uh, and you don't think we've got the, the historical precedent of John Major and his surprise victory in 92? You don't think that shares in Rishi Sunak are perhaps a little too low at the moment? Not really. I mean, I think we've, you know, I've lived through failure after failure of Labour governments, disappointment after disappointment, uh, election after election. So I, 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 you know, I know that that's what happens very often. Over two thirds of my lifetime has been governed by Conservative governments. But I think this time it's impossible. The next two years, people's incomes are going to drop by 6%. And mm. in the end, it's the economy, stupid. And people really will feel it in their pocket. This has never happened before. You were constructively critical of New Labour, but you did describe them as the best government of your political lifetime. Does Starmer have to become Tony Blair to win? <laughs> I don't think anybody can be Tony Blair. Starmer is Starmer. Has he got Blair's class? I don't know what you mean. His by craft, that. just the the X factor, as they say. Has he? Has he? You know, is he? Is he at the Tony Blair level, charisma, all the rest of it? No, he's not. He's something quite different. Mm. He's very, he's very solid. He's a lawyer. He's run a, 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 an important department as chief prosecutor. Um, he has different kind of experience. I think he has less political experience. I think he's less agile politically. I think that's true. But on the other hand, people are getting a bit wary of the politically agile. And maybe being a solid citizen is a good thing. Yes, with Sunak and Starmer, we're in a grey era of politics, aren't we? Uh, well, we've just been in such an exotic, upside-down, extraordinarily turbulent era. I don't think anybody's going to match up to Boris Johnson and, uh, and Liz Truss. Um, it's, perhaps it's more like the Theresa May era. <laughs> Possibly so. Now, Keir Starmer this weekend has told uh, an interview, I think it was with The Times, that 99.9% .9 of women don't have a penis. With his, will his, um, his hitherto uh, difficulties in defining a woman be a factor at the next election, do you think? I don't think very much so. I mean, I think the Conservatives are looking around for every single issue they can have which is not about the economy. Mm. You know, they'll look for any kind of wokery, any kind of trumped up little something or another as a distraction, something to talk about, talking points. But in the end, what's going to cut is going to be public services and the money in people's pockets uh, and, and the blow that they've had to their wages uh, due to inflation. And although inflation will come down, uh, they're still going to be paying out a lot more than they're getting in in terms of wages. It's going to be a gap. So I think that's what really matters. I and mean, then as for the question about what's a woman, I think he said it very well. I think it makes sense. It's a small issue. You're not a transphobe for saying that. Stand up for the rights of trans people. But, uh, you know, most women are born women and don't have penises. 
But it doesn't you, mean that other people can't be women too if, if that's what they want to be. Do you not share the views of politics, politics professor at the University of Kent, Matthew Goodwin, who has suggested that these so-called culture wars could be a big factor, particularly in the red wall seats in the north of England, where voters might be Labour supporting by tradition, but are also socially conservative? Well, what's interesting is the trans issue has no salience whatever. I mean, when Ipsos Mori does its regular what's the most important issue, it is just nowhere. I mean, you can stir people up for a bit, but when you stop and ask them what do you really think about politics now, they think about the NHS, they think about social care, they think about schools, mm. and they think about uh, how their wages have fallen behind. And what about the channel migrant crisis? Do you think it was a mistake by Starmer not to at least include it in his top five priorities? Because there are those Red Wall constituencies that are concerned, aren't they, about illegal immigration in this country? Oh, I think everybody all across the world and, you know, mm. places which have got much worse uh, immigrant problems than we Italy. have. Italy. It is a real mm. problem because a lot of people in the world are on the move because of climate... Because 100 of million, wars. potentially. Yes, uh, and it's very alarming for every government. And, I, you know, in that sense, we're lucky in this country that we've had many fewer than France, than Italy, than Germany, than Greece. Uh, so we make a huge fuss about it, but we should put it in some context that everybody is struggling with this and we have a lesser problem, not a greater problem. You'd think, the way our newspapers talk about it on the right, that we were the worst in the world. It's just not the case. I think, you know, controlling your borders is a prime duty of any mm. government, but it's really hard to do. It's like saying controlling crime is a prime duty. Mm. You can't promise but, I'm going to have a crime-free government. No, but do you not think Labour need to own it, given the fact that they need to win back the Red Wall? It is seven, six, seven million pounds a day in hotel accommodation, mm. 50,000 people at the moment in yeah. hotels. It's not sustainable, is it? No, it's a real problem. Uh, I mean, you can't say it's not, not sustainable. Actually, we can, we can absorb those people, but it's expensive, it's unpopular, uh, people want to know who's coming in and they want to choose who comes in, which is very reasonable. But it doesn't mean on an island like this that you can necessarily protect your every inch of your shores all the time against people arriving in boats. It is a real problem. And I think Labour's right to say the government's made an awful mess of it. I mean, what are they doing not processing people for one, two, three years? We need to process them. We need to get them jobs. They want to work and we have loads of jobs. It's it's absolutely mad to keep people in hotels when they could be working, you know, living their own lives. I mean, if we haven't got a way of sending them back, and I don't think Rwanda's going to work, even if they send a few there, it is not going to solve the whole problem. Um, we've got to find a way of letting them work when we need them. And speaking of work, you flirted with politics. You stood for the uh, SDP in 1983. I think you came third, which is decent. <laughs> in, was it East Lewisham? East Lewisham. I got exactly the same as everybody got in the SDP right it was across about, London. It was about, about 10,000 votes or something. Is that the career that got away? <laughs> no. It's not... I, I mean, I was neither better nor worse. The thing is that individuals make awfully little difference. MPs mm. like to imagine mm. uh, that, they are, that they're being chosen personally, but you're not. And the SDP didn't manage to make that great breakthrough in 1983 that it looked as if it might have done when we had on one side, very unpopular mm. until the Falklands War. Michael Foote on the other side, very unpopular on the far left. And there really seemed to be a need for something in the middle. Uh, but under our electoral system, in the end, people vote against the person they fear most. They either fear Thatcher or they feared Michael Foote most and they didn't dare vote for something else. And until we have a proportional representation system, it's the fate of any... You know, you're, you're yeah. Nigel Farage, who stood, he, what, he eight wants times? It. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. never gets through. It's impossible. Do you, do you think if Starmer achieves, briefly if you can, an overall majority, that he should introduce legislation for PR? I wish he would. I don't think he, I don't think he's Turkeys planning don't to. don't vote for Christmas, right? If he gets I, a majority, then that disproves the argument. I don't just think it's that. I think it's because it would take an awful lot of, uh, mm. lot of time and he's got a lot of things to do and these big, uh, great big constitutional questions yeah. just absorb too much political well, energy. I, I, I suspect I, so, I, I agree with you. I, we're probably a couple of hung parliaments away from that becoming a reality, but I suspect it's, it's going to happen. Polly Toynbee, a thrill to have you in the studio. Please come back and see us soon, especially when that book is out. My thanks to Polly Toynbee, a very welcome guest to Mark Dolan tonight. Your reaction to what she's had to say coming up in my take at 10, it's time to say no to a cashless society. See you in three.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, you, my, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10 in just a moment, the move to a cashless society is a direct assault on people power. I'm not having it. Cash is king. My newsmaker Anne Whittacombe discusses the new Brexit trade deal. Is it a game changer for this country and for you and me? Also, are those delays in Dover really due to Brexit? Plus the papers with full pundit reaction, big guests, big stories, big opinions, a lively hour to come, the horror of a cashless society next. But first, the headlines with the very well-heeled Aaron Armstrong. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Yes, hello there. Welcome to GB News from... Me, Aaron Armstrong, a prominent Russian military blogger, has been killed in an explosion at a cafe in St. Petersburg. Vladlin Tatarsky was a vocal supporter of Russia's war in Ukraine. He had more than half a million followers on Telegram. The incident appears to be the second assassination on Russian soil of a figure closely associated with the conflict. At least 25 people were also injured. No one has yet claimed responsibility for the blast. The Home Secretary's blamed political correctness for the failure to tackle grooming gangs. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Suella Braverman says authorities have turned a blind eye over fears of being labelled racist or bigoted, and she singled out British Pakistani men for particular concern. She has pledged to put people working with children in England under a new legal duty to report signs or suspicion of sexual abuse. The Safeguarding Minister, Sarah Dine, says it's a scourge of our society can't stop in 
making sure that people are protected. Children are the most vulnerable part of our society as well as the elderly. We must make sure that they're not sexually abused. So I don't accept we're going to be rife with false reports. There may be one or two and they will be dealt with and identified. The overwhelming people that gave evidence are speaking the truth to the inquiry and it was very heartbreaking testimony. We need to act. Holiday makers hoping to cross the Channel are still experiencing long delays at the port of Dover, which are likely to go through the night. Some people have been waiting around eight hours or more. It's understood all coaches have finally reached the port, but passengers still face a further few hours of waiting to have their passports checked. Officials there have blamed delays on a lengthy immigration process, but Suella Braverman has rejected suggestions Brexit is responsible. The families of two British men being detained in Afghanistan by the Taliban say they're being treated fairly after speaking to them in an unscripted emotional call. A spokesman for Kevin Cornwell and a second unnamed man says it represents tremendous progress. They've been in custody since January. It is unclear, though, how long the third man, the so-called danger tourist, Miles Routledge, has been held by the Taliban. The government says it's in negotiations regarding their safety. 29 people are now known to have died after a series of tornadoes swept through the United States over the weekend. Officials say more than 40 reports were made across seven states in the south and the midwest of the country on Friday. Homes have been destroyed and cars upended. An entire school in Arkansas was ripped apart with students and teachers saying they're grateful to have not been inside. President Joe Biden has declared a major disaster in that state. He's ordered federal support to help with the recovery. TV online, DAB plus radio. And on TuneIn, this is GB News. Now it's back to Mark. He's rolling in it. My thanks to Aaron Armstrong, who's back in an hour. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Tonight's newsmaker is Anne Widdicombe, who tells me whether that bumper new trans-Pacific trade deal is a game changer for Britain. And are those delays in Dover really down to Brexit? Anne, as always, has the answers. We've got the papers at 10.30 sharp with full pundit reaction. And I'll be asking my pundits later in the show, should celebrities stay out of politics? And how often should you clean your carpet? All the big questions. Uh, lots of stories to get through, big guests and always big opinions. A massive hour to come. We start with my take at 10. There's an old saying, cash is king. Never has that been truer in 2023, as governments and corporations encourage us to stop using cash notes and coins. New research from Link, the cash machine people, published in the Daily Mail, shows that more than half of the public have had their cash rejected by retailers or been discouraged from using it in recent weeks. The dash towards a cashless society is affecting huge numbers of shoppers who want to make purchases with coins and notes. People are now struggling to get pounds and pennies accepted in restaurants and cafes and whilst paying for parking. You've got to use those terrible apps on your phone. Back to me, folks. Now, for some, tapping your credit card on a machine or waving your phone may be quick and convenient, but the technology comes with huge risks. Take a look at Nigeria, for example, Africa's most populous country, which is seeking to limit the amount of money citizens can withdraw each day. The Central Bank of Nigeria hopes to cap withdrawals from ATMs, banks and cashback purchases at around £30 a day. This according to the Associated, the Associated Press. Now, they're partly doing this because they're facing a cash flow crisis, but partly because they're seeking to transition to a cashless economy. Terrifying. In my view, this is part of a wider campaign at government and corporate level to kill, kill cash altogether and potentially in time transfer all of us to a digital programmable currency controlled by the state. As with the pandemic measures, the push for a cashless society is an attack on people power. If you have cash, your spending habits cannot be traced and your funds cannot be frozen in the way, of course, that they can with a digital currency. Don't forget that tin pot dictator Justin Trudeau 
Canada's tyrannical premier, who froze the bank accounts of protesting uh, vaccine mandate truckers. Well, he couldn't have done that with cash. In terms of a cashless society, all roads lead to China. It's the worst case scenario, the thick end of the wedge. Chinese citizens are part of what's called a social credit system in which people's money is controlled digitally by the government. They've got virtual cash in their virtual bank accounts, access to which is linked to good behaviour. And with facial recognition cameras everywhere, the Chinese public can lose access to their money for the most minor indiscretion. If someone is spotted littering or walking home drunk or not being up to date with their vaccines or guilty of some other perceived crime, this fully digitised system will punish them immediately by stopping them paying for goods in the supermarket or from buying a train ticket, the stuff of nightmares. With a cashless society, the control is transferred from the people to corporations and the state. And in a cashless society, how can you give your nephew a tenner for their birthday or leave a couple of pound coins for that waiter or waitress that served you so nicely? How can you help out a homeless person that needs a few quid to get by? They don't have machines. What about the wonderful informality of a retired pensioner cleaning your windows or doing a bit of gardening and receiving a crisp £20 note as a thank you? A cashless society will spell the end of the informal discretionary economy. Cash is human. Cashless is inhuman. Come rain or shine, if you've got cash on you, you're secure. If we allow a cashless society to happen, that could spell the end of your financial autonomy. Don't believe me? Well, ask those Canadian truckers or the Children's Pressure Group, us for them, or the Free Speech Union, both of whose funds were blocked by PayPal. Their great crime? Being critical of COVID measures. Welcome to hell. Cash is indeed king. Always has been, always will be. Beware the outlets offering the snake oil convenience of cashless and fight this at every turn. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. Au revoir, flexible friend. I'll be on them uh, to the phone for an hour to get that replaced tomorrow, but there you go. Uh, let's get reaction now to this uh, from currency expert uh, Leia Hulpen, who is the author of the best-selling book, Undressing Bitcoin. She's also the star of the popular Leia Hulpen show on YouTube. Hi, Leia. Welcome to the show. Hi, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, great to have you uh, back on the program. Have I overstated the threat to our freedoms of a cashless society? No, I think you stated it perfectly, Mark. Um, you know, you say you think this is part of a greater campaign to move us onto a central bank digital currency, and I totally agree with you. You're absolutely right. Because right now, we're living through many different woke climate crisis agendas. We, you know, we've gone from COVID, we're now onto the climate crisis, whatever it is, and they need people to comply with their agenda. During COVID, I believe they overstepped their mark and people have had enough. They won't take their boosters anymore. Um, but they need people to start complying. And how do they do that? They do that with the money because once you control the money you control the world and like you said that money will be programmable and so right now they want us to start tracking our carbon they want to implement some sort of carbon allowance and how do you do that with the money you program the money so mark say you want to have a barbecue when the summer finally comes in the uk and uh, you know you want to buy some sausages some meat whatever it is you could actually reach your carbon allowance so that the next week when you go to fill up your car with gas well your, your money gets declined because you reached your carbon allowance. So it essentially allows you and allows them to control every little thing that we do. And it is so concerning because money money is really just the energy which fuels your life. So if you don't have control over your money, well, you don't really have control over anything. Isn't this a bit of a conspiracy theory, though? It might happen in China, but not in a free country like Britain or the United States. 
You know, it's so funny when people say that because right now the West copy everything that China does. They, they admire it. Justin Trudeau talks about China as if it's this incredible country and how he really values everything China does. We copied their COVID response and we are copying their CBDC response. We saw it with Rishi Sunak. He's so excited about Bitcoin. Right now, nine, more than 90% of world banks are all working towards a CBDC. And actually, one of the biggest issues here is the lack of privacy because like like you said, you know, if you say the wrong thing or you like the wrong thing on social media, they will know that it's you. They will be able to control your money and switch it off. This is why I'm a huge advocate for not only Bitcoin, but privacy coins, privacy coins where it's entirely anonymous and also you can't track it. And there are many different people working on this, whether it's somebody like TommyNet who are building a decentralized internet. They're also building a decentralized privacy coin. And so these sorts of things, Bitcoin and privacy coins, I look at as the solution to a CBD. OK, and I hear you've got those options, but do you think that uh, actually a cashless society is inevitable and it will be replaced by things like Bitcoin and these other solutions? Do you think that cash will be a thing of the past? Unfortunately, I do think cash will be a thing of the past. Um, and I know you did say cash is king. I don't think necessarily it has to be a bad thing when we do have solutions like Bitcoin and like privacy coins. These things will, these things are inevitable. We are living in a new digital world right now where people are doing business with people globally, global trade. And so we desperately do need an alternative to actually cater for this new digital world. Whether you like cash or not, I do think it will be, be a thing of the past. But as long as we do have things like Bitcoin and privacy coins, like Tommy are building, then I think we will be uh, protected to a greater extent. Uh, my thanks to Leia Halpern, who is the star of the Leia Halpern show on YouTube. She's got a huge number of subscribers. Do go on YouTube and find out why. She's on Twitter as well. I've been asking you, our viewers and listeners, whether you're happy to live in a cashless society. Well, the results are in. 15% say yes. 15.8% that is. 84.2% say no. So a resounding landslide for keeping cash. Uh, we've got the papers at 10.30 sharp with full pundit reaction. But next, my newsmaker, the iconic Anne Widdicombe, discusses whether Britain's new trans-Pacific trade deal is a game changer for Britain. And is that congestion in Dover really down to Brexit? Anne Widdicombe's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you And whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Oh, my goodness, uh, says Ian. Are you sure that Britain's a free country? The government want to force cows to stop farting. Yeah, we'll be talking about that later uh, with Neil Parrish, ex-Tory MP and now farmer. The government are going to give these cows all sorts of weird produce to stop them belching and doing all sorts of other uh, methane-related things. On the cashless society... Uh, this from Richard Mark. The government is pushing us towards a cashless society. I'm not having it. I want change. Uh, there you go. Well, it's about personal autonomy, isn't it? Something that clearly disappeared during the pandemic. Uh, lots more to get through. We've got the papers at exactly 10.30 sharp with full pundit reaction. But it's time now for the newsmaker in which we tackle a big story of the day in the company of a fearless commentator. Tonight, the government have signed off on a trans-Pacific trade deal comprising 11 nations around the Pacific Rim, including Japan, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Our own Liam Halligan points out in The Telegraph this weekend that the so-called CPTPP is a trade agreement between countries accounting for 13% of global commerce, with the UK joining that rises to over 15%, the same as the 27 nations in the EU. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. So is this a game changer for Britain to tackle these topics and many more? I'm delighted to welcome former government minister, best-selling author and television personality Anne Widdicombe. Anne, is this deal good news for Britain? Oh, it's hugely good news for Britain, something we couldn't have done while we were in the EU. One of the things we said we wanted to do uh, when we left the EU was to mm. set up our own trade agreements. This is, this is a, a really major achievement because we're with all the big players like Australia and Canada, Japan, Singapore, you know, and uh, we'll be able to do tariff-free trade with, with those massive economies. So it's a huge, huge step in the right direction. And we could not have done it without Brexit. And, and that is the point that we need to make all the time. Every time we achieve something because of Brexit, uh, it's played down. Anytime something goes wrong that people want to blame on Brexit, it's played up. Now, this fortunately has got the headlines. I, I think even the BBC can't ignore this one. You know, this is a big plus benefit of Brexit. And it opens up a whole set of new economies, tariff-free trade, uh, makes us part of a massive trading bloc. Uh, and uh, without all the rules uh, and subjugation that came with the EU. Not surprising, Anne, that so many sore loser Remainers have been giving this deal short shrift, including in the media. Yes, I mean, it's not surprising at all. Uh, the Remainers haven't got over their defeat. They still have hopes of rejoining. Uh, but that is a long way down the track. What they're trying to do stage by stage is simply to get us nearer to the EU. When something like this happens that takes us further from the EU, they don't, of course, like it. But it's one of the things that Britain was promised. You know, if we leave the EU, we'll be able to set up trade deals. And everybody said, oh, yes, ha, 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 you know, you'll get a little deal here and a little deal there. You're not going to get something really big like the EU. And we've got something much better than the EU. Critics have said, Anne, that it could only add 0.08% to our GDP, our gross domestic product. And this pales in comparison with the 4% the economy will lose as a result of Brexit. Your reaction to those figures? Well, my reaction to those figures is that, that we're still adding more than we're losing. 
um, and that actually this is a, a, a game for the medium and the long term. It's not mm. something that tomorrow morning we're suddenly going to see, you know, vast quantities of wealth. Uh, but what we are going to see is hugely increased trade opportunities with, as I say, freedom from the petty fogging law that came with uh, EU trade deals. It's not only about figures, it's about freedom. Yes, because we get free trade, but no loss of sovereignty. Exactly. That sums it up. Yes, you've summed it up admirably. Oh, well, there's a, you know, there's a first time for everything. Um, and ca can I also say that I think credit is due to uh, Liam Fox and also to Liz Truss for getting the yeah. ball rolling on this one. And of course, Kemi Badenoch for closing the deal. Yes, very much to Liz Truss, who really did start this one going uh, and did all that she could while she was getting other trade deals. You know, she wasn't just mm. dealing with this one. Uh, so I think huge credit to her and to those others who've been involved, uh, uh, to Liam and to Kami. Yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, and, uh, but above all, it's because of Brexit. We couldn't have done without Brexit. Now, you know, in many ways, we haven't yet got Brexit. We haven't yet taken full mm. advantage of Brexit. Uh, but this today um, is exactly what we were all hoping for. However, Anne, it's time to throw a spanner in the works because was it not Rishi Sunak's much maligned Windsor framework which unlocked this deal? I don't think you can say that the Windsor framework uh, unlocked it. This deal has been worked on for a very, very long time and, and, and the detail uh, would not have all been thrashed out in the very short period of time we've had mm. since the Windsor framework. And the Windsor framework betrays Northern Ireland, it imperils the Union, uh, it keeps a part of the UK under EU law, which has, of course, a ratchet effect uh, on the rest of the UK. Uh, so, no, um, I'm not going to be uh, seduced into saying, oh, this is all due to the Windsor framework. This is due to a lot of awfully hard work that's been going on uh, for several years uh, on the part of government ministers, civil servants, trade experts, uh, and all the countries involved, of course. It is just not just Britain. This is a tremendous, this is a tremendous step forward. And of course, this agreement is another barrier to re-entry, to rejoining the EU, which would be a democratic travesty. It's an insurance policy against, against uh, going back into the arms of the EU. Uh, can I ask you, though, Anne, and I appreciate your positive tone on this one. I'm delighted to. And I got dog's abuse on this show on Friday for being very enthusiastic about this, this new agreement. But why does it matter to my viewers and listeners? Well, it matters because uh, it means that we can, as I say, we get tariff-free trade with some of the world's greatest economies. Uh, it doesn't come with all the law that, that used to hamper such um, agreements with the EU. Uh, and uh, it's going to make a difference, therefore, to the wealth of the nation. And anything that makes a difference to the wealth of the nation makes a difference to your viewers and to, uh, to all of us. Yes, indeed. And it, it, it places us at the heart of Asia, which is going to be the great growing economy of the 21st century. And can we talk about those delays in Dover? My heart goes out yeah. to the many Brits yeah. trying to get to France for their holidays. Is it due to Brexit? Uh, no. Um, Brexit itself isn't to blame for anything. It's what people have done with Brexit that makes mm. the difference. Now, this is all uh, happening on the French side. Uh, this is French inefficiency. Uh, this is the French saying they're going to make our lives awkward precisely because of Brexit. Now, the net result will be uh, that sooner or later people are going to say, well, we won't go to France. You know, we'll go somewhere else where it's more efficient. But it's also, it's not just deliberate provocation. It is much more inefficiency, failure to provide um, enough staff at the very moment that there was going to be increased traffic because it is, after all, the holidays. That's not rocket science to work that out. Um, but uh, France is in a bit of a pickle in general at the moment, so perhaps the poor things just can't quite get it right. Absolutely right. Tom P, as they say, c'est la vie. And a thrill to have you back on the show. We'll see you in a week's time. Anne Whittacombe is always our newsmaker every Sunday night. Thanks, Anne. And next up, we've got tomorrow's papers in full, all the front pages with full pundit reaction. Also, should celebrities stay out of politics? All of that's next.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. Thank you for your company this evening. We've had uh, such a busy show and uh, lots of emails have been coming in thick and fast. Where do I start? Mark at gbnews.uk. Um, how about this? Uh, Douglas, hi, Mark. When are you going to send Anne Widdicombe off to the high security nursing home? She's obviously escaped from one of those. I've never heard such bilge that she comes out with. She obviously doesn't live on the same planet as the rest of us do. Douglas there, not pulling his punches in regard to Anne and what she had to say. However, there's a counter-argument to every argument. This from Pam. Anne Widdicombe, so sensible. As always, go Anne, says Pam. There you go, that rhymes. It was almost a poem. Of course, there is a delay at Dover, says John. So many immigration processing uh, officials, uh, so many dinghies, that is the problem. OK, and uh, also, uh, how about this? Oh, yeah, no, let's have a look. Sorry, um, we'll come to... Oh, yeah, cashless society, that's right. Uh, we were just talking about whether or not you would like to have a cashless society. James says, hi, Mark, we live in California, which leans Marxist. We've stopped using shops and online uh, that refuse to take cash. It's becoming more difficult. Uh, Jim, thank you for that. A reminder that this show is global. Of course, my priority 
is the people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but the show is global. People are watching everywhere on YouTube. It's time now for this. Yes, we've got tomorrow's papers. I'm looking forward to getting through these because uh, we've got some cracking stories. Where shall we start? Let's go to, I think, The Independent is first. OK, what a disgrace. Government U-turns on pledge to stop executives using apprentice fund to further their own careers. What a waste. Minister admits they're gaming the system but still turns a blind eye to misuse of your tax money. The government has backtracked on its pledge to crack down on the use of taxpayers' money to fund university courses for people earning six-figure salaries. Uh, Financial Times, oil producers spring surprise output cuts of more than a million barrels a day. Bad news for our energy supplies. The I newspaper, NHS mental health care faces public inquiry after family outcry. UK's largest ever investigation into NHS mental health services is expected to be upgraded to a full public inquiry, meaning medics must give evidence about 2,000 deaths. Uh, Metro, the Easter hull delays fear over 19-hour ferry hold-ups as France is blamed for the backlog. The Daily Telegraph, ethnicity of grooming gangs cannot be ignored, police told. Political correctness must no longer prevent the police from using the ethnicity of suspects to identify grooming gangs. Uh, This is uh, something that Rishi Sunak will say tomorrow. Asian grooming gangs would not be allowed to evade justice because of cultural sensitivities. This according to a government spokesman um, speaking ahead of the unveiling of a package of measures designed to crack down on organised networks of abusers. Bomb in statue kills Kremlin propagandist. Russia's second city of St. Petersburg was yesterday hit by an explosion in a cafe that killed an ultra-nationalist war correspondent and propagandist. Also, phone alerts will cause chaos. Plans to test a mobile phone emergency siren could bring chaos to the roads as drivers panic upon hearing the alert. This according uh, to insiders in Whitehall. And for now, the Daily Star. I love you. Terminate marriage. Robots are taking over the world and the missus. Sydney, the chatbot, scared the pants off a boffin by telling him to dump his other half. It's a fatal AI traction. There you go. And those are your front pages. Fantastic stuff. Now, reacting to all of that, my brilliant pundits tonight, David Oldroyd Bolt, who is, of course, a bit of a legend, a historian and political commentator, journalist and consultant Emma Burnell, award-winning playwright as well. So annoying how talented she is. And former Conservative MP and now farmer Neil Parrish, Uh, Neil, can we talk about this uh, rather extraordinary story that uh, cows, livestock, are going to be given a special feed to stop them belching? Tell me more. Basically, um, if if a cow can actually digest and a sheep can digest the the proteins better, the food that they're taking in, they'll belch less Mm. and they'll create less methane gas. The the New Zealanders have done much with their diet and this is a natural diet of grasses and clovers. So I think we can do a lot more. Uh, I don't want to see too many chemicals actually given to our cows because Mm. um, that's what worries me and sheep. But I think, you know, we can do a lot more. um, And I think it'll be good because, you know, using good grasses to produce our our meat, uh, but if we can reduce the amount of methane, will be a good step forward. So um, the the New Zealanders wanted to bring a tax in on the the methane gas, and of course it was um, nicknamed the fart tax. Um, So we do do have to be a little careful, I suggest, if we go down the, dare I say it, the fart tax. Uh, Yeah, I mean, um, would you be able to tell me a bit more about your bullocks? (laughs) <laughs> I, I, yes, my, my Herefords. Yeah, they, you are, they, they you are, are cattle, by what, the way. What is a... I, I want to put you right on this matter. <laughs> they're cattle. All right, they're cattle, they have white faces they're not women. and they're brown. They're not women, no, no, right. they're cattle. They're not sheep. No. Um, tell, me, tell me about, uh, what, what, you've got a head of cattle, how many? 30. That's yes. brilliant. That's a, that is a full-time job, isn't it? Well, it's uh, getting that way, and I'll yeah. probably take it up to 50, and, um, and it, it keeps, me, keeps me off the internet. How many so of them? It gets, <laughs> gets me out in the field. Yeah. Yeah. It keeps you off that smartphone. It does, which, which I should have been off a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, listen, what, uh, what, uh, did you milk any of them? Or, or what? No, no, they're, 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 these, are, these are beef animals, you All see. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I have to educate you the difference between a, a yeah. dairy cow Why and a beef animal. Why can't you eat a, a dairy cow? 
Well, you do eat in a berry cow when, when later on in life. Right. Uh, but um, most of that is sort of older meat for processing. Um, oh. So your your beef animal is your high quality beef where you get your your ribeye steaks and the like. You see, which you. So what, what's the ribeye like in an aging cow? Uh, well, it'll be just a bit tougher, really. Right. Um, so, um, so do we not wind up eating the, the old cow meat? Does it go into dog food and stuff? No, 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 no. A lot of it goes to France, actually. There you that's go. Why the, Quite right, That's too. why the French got so worked up <laughs> over BSE, because of the, of the barren cows. But I won't go into the send details it, of that. Send it to them. Um, um, the metro.co.uk, the Easter hole delays. It's a nightmare for many Brits trying to get away, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's absolutely not what you want. If we, We're all working so hard at the moment yep. and I think we've had a, a rough old winter and those people who are using this Easter break in fact my my sister and her children are away at the moment yeah um, yeah they the last thing they want and if you've chosen to go by ferry it's probably because you can't afford the other options so it is yes. the people on the sharper end who are sitting in these queues for hours and hours and hours and it's no way to start a holiday and of course what they are then going to have hanging over their whole holiday is the notion that it's going to be just the same Coming on the way back, home. And they'll need a holiday when they get yeah, home because exactly. they've had another 20 hour wait. Uh, David, even Simon Calder, who's the travel editor at The Independent, has said this is because of Brexit. Is that true? Well, as Anne Whittacombe said, it is because of Brexit, because the French are being vindictive yet again, and why are we surprised by this? Or, or just incompetent? Well, vindictiveness would uh, perhaps would look better on the French than sheer incompetence. It's up to them to decide which they wish to be labelled by the Brits uh, for, the, for this period. It is, of course, horrid, because, as Emma says, these are people uh, who are probably uh, struggling the most and need the holiday the most. It's possible that they might therefore decide it next time that they'll go somewhere else and the French might therefore decide that they need to stop acting so horribly to us. You would hope so. Will they? We'll see in summer. Well, I think a lot of this, like so many issues around Brexit, will be logistical mm. and that actually in time they'll scan passports more quickly, mm. the paperwork will go digital and I don't think we'll be having this conversation in 10 years' time. Oh, in 10 years' time, absolutely not, no, because the French will realise that it's not in their interest to hold up mm. Britons for the best part uh, of a day at the ports when they want to come in and spend their money there. And I think it won't necessarily be pressure from within the French government. It will be people, you know, people in, in Normandy, people in Brittany, where the ferries send uh, tourists, who are saying, you know, come on, let these people in, we're losing out here. Now, lots of high-profile lawyers and uh, other media types uh, from, from what can only be described as the sort of... North London figure-wagging <laughs> metropolitan elites. Brexit's favourite people. Their favourite people, right? It's favourite people. And, and, and this group has been, has been sort of pointed out by Matthew Goodwin, the professor, the academics, mm. uh, the, the politics professor, in his new book. Um, they've been very excised about Suella Braverman's comments in relation to grooming gangs, suggesting it's racist. But we've got the Daily Telegraph tomorrow saying ethnicity of grooming gangs cannot be ignored. And this is what the Prime Minister will say tomorrow. Your own investigation showed what a problem this was. There has been testimony after testimony after testimony from the people who were the victims of the grooming gangs and their families saying that they were ignored and sometimes themselves made the victims of really quite reprehensible treatment from social services because there was a fear in the North and the Midlands that this would be seen as a racist campaign. It was very clear to the uh, social services and the police in these areas what was going on. Overwhelmingly they, Pakistani grooming gangs. It was overwhelmingly Pakistani grooming gangs. This was known about for the best part of a decade. It is a national scandal. There should be heads rolling from civil services. There should be senior policemen of the time who are having to be held responsibility for not investigating this. And I'm very, very glad indeed that the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister are choosing now to give this the light it so dearly deserves. Emma, I know it's a complex issue, but the Prime Minister tomorrow will order police forces to improve the recording and analysis of ethnicity data um, in an attempt to prevent perpetrators of abuse from falling through the net, which, let's be honest, has happened to hundreds, if not thousands, of young girls. Absolutely. And I think it's really, really important that we put child safeguarding first mm. and the perpetrators, whoever they are, should not feel safe to, do, to enact those crimes. And that has to be the blind principle of justice. Mm. Um, now, I have plenty of friends within the British Pakistani community who are just as horrified as the rest of, of us. Of course. Mm. Um, so what's really important is that we don't go, this is 
endemic within that community. Absolutely not. So that is that is the subtle difference that has to happen in the public conversation. But we are it is but absolutely right. But to ignore right. to be colourblind to it to ignore but ethnicity to be, yeah. is perhaps a problem. No, to, I, I don't think it's about ignoring ethnicity. It's That's about what making we've done, sure isn't it? that I think it, uh, we've actually done the opposite um, of ignoring ethnicity. Ethnicity yeah. has become a way of people saying you cannot pursue me for these crimes. Actually, that is a vast calumny on the people of that ethnicity, the 99.999% the, the of British Pakistanis who are absolutely horrified by these crimes. These people are using excuses and they shouldn't be allowed to. But what we have to identify, Neil, is if it's an issue within the culture of, of one or another community. Um, but the broadcaster Adil Ray tweeted today... Um, Suella Bravman has singled out the British Pakistani community as perpetrators of sexual grooming. He cites a documentary uh, that he made in 2011 um, outlining a disproportionate number, uh, but as the Home Office's own report in 2020 confirmed, the majority are white in terms of grooming gangs. So where do we go from here? Yeah, I, mean, I think we've just got to make sure that, it, that it treat whatever ethnicity yeah. um, you are, that you are treated exactly the same. You can't hide behind that. Um, and then to make sure that everybody is, is actually brought to book over this, because I think we have got to stamp it out. Um, there were some real problems problems in the Midlands at times in particular. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we let's make sure that everybody um, who is grooming uh, is dealt with uh, um, and brought to court and, and locked up if necessary. Emma? That, that's the key to it. Yeah, I, co I couldn't agree more. And I do think what slightly concerns me, and I would very much like to hear uh, Rishi Sunak reassure about this, is there won't be an overcorrection that we aren't looking at, as it, as it is clear in the Home mm. Office report, the majority of white perpetrators us too, of that course. we don't overlook them. So I think let's be really conscious that the problem here is child abuse. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we have to deal with, whoever is abusing But if there's, if there's a, an endemic pattern within certain communities, then the police have to make that focus in order to stop these crimes, don't they, David? If that is found in the course of investigation to be the case, then yes. Uh, uh, Emma's point that, uh, that British Pakistanis uh, who were perpetrating grooming felt that they had uh, essentially indemnity from prosecution and from investigation. This was so because they were given that impression by police and social services. And I think we need to return to this point and there needs to be a serious investigation uh, that brings those who gave uh, abusers that impression absolute justice because the victims deserve it. There must be recompense to the victims and that comes with those who uh, gave their abusers impunity uh, receiving penalties. Uh, coming up, should pop stars stay out of politics after the uh, next Eurovision star has been attacking Boris Johnson and Brexit? Uh, also, we've got tomorrow's Times newspaper. And how often should you clean your carpet? All the big questions don't go anywhere, Stephen, too. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit on well, my are. You, my you, you, no. My political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes. <laughs> on. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Kerr. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News.
We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. We've got more papers for you. Let's have a look at the Times newspaper. And they lead with child abuse gangs fed by political correctness. Returning to a story we discussed just a moment ago, Sunak announces a task force to target grooming. And also Brexit clash as rules are blamed for Dover chaos. Officials at the port of Dover clashed with the Home Secretary Tonight, over her claims that border delays stretching to 15 hours had nothing to do with Brexit. Well, that one's going to run and run. Uh, let's get to some more stories. And this one caught our eye. May Muller, who is representing the UK at the next Eurovision, is in, uh, it turns out, is a left-wing activist who hates Boris Johnson and said he did not deserve an ICU bed during the pandemic. May, who will perform her track in Liverpool next month, made the remarks as Boris was receiving medical treatment for the virus. So, should celebrities stay out of politics? Neil? Yeah, I mean, I think you won't keep celebrities out of politics. I think being having previously been an elected politician, I don't want to sound too pompous about it, but at least you actually are elected and therefore you are answerable then to your electorate. The problem is, if you're not, you can actually pontificate on anything. And I think, you know, I mean, of all the crimes that Boris may or may have not committed, mm. to actually target on the fact that he actually nearly died and he needed to be in hospital and we nearly actually lost a serving prime minister through that, um, I think is a bit rich. So I think, you know, I mean, let's be careful what we do. And I think the thing is, too, I think the trouble with celebrity is that you naturally you can say or do whatever you like. Um, and I mean, that's free speech. Um, I'm not going to argue against it. No. But, but I think people do actually follow celebrities very much. Um, I, th I suppose as a politician, we probably actually hate that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I can understand why. But I am, I think, I think it's dangerous sometimes when people have very, you know, very extreme views on anybody, um, that it, it's not it's not right. Is it not, Emma, a problem on the left? I mean, you're a, a delightful, very cuddly lefty. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your I nice know. way of saying I'm fat? And by, no, not at all. <laughs> You've got a figure to die for, let me tell you. But um, the the issue is, it's not mainstream folk on the left, is it? But there's a sort of rump of people, perhaps at the, at the edge of, of, you know, both sides, who can be very cruel. There are people who can be very cruel. Um, there always have been. There are celebrities on the left and on the right who say things to get attention. I don't think she did say this to get attention because she said it a long time before she mm. was um, thrust into the public eye. Look, I wouldn't have said that. I think it's 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 tasteless. But I would absolutely, as a free speech champion, defend her you. right to say well, it. Well, I'm with you that, exactly. We can definitely say it. But it's telling, isn't it, that left-leaning actors like Miriam Margulies said yeah. that she'd wished Boris Johnson had died. Yeah. Yeah. I don't hear too much of that from the right. 
No, I don't think you do, because uh, the right tends not to be as tasteless and crass as the left, because they know they won't get away <coughs> with Jim it. Jim Davidson. Well, yes, and look what happened to Jim <laughs> Davidson's career. Do you see him on BBC Two presenting game shows now? No, no you don't. He's you on see... every celebrity He's... reality show going! Uh, <laughs> which is, of course, the height of, of public uh, entertainment. But Miriam Margulies is still I mean, I love asking them. quite high-profile <laughs> things, because the left does have a degree of impunity. Look, this has always been the case with, with people uh, of the creative arts, because they are of a, a sort of a hyper mind. Richard Wagner mm -hmm. was a, a revolutionary who had to leave Germany because he was trying to overthrow the monarchy and then went on, on to write one of the most vile tracks of anti-Semitic rubbish ever produced. It didn't stop the fact that he wrote probably the greatest opera ever written as well. There have been pop stars ever since the advent of pop who've had bizarre views. Uh, Rob, you know, Robert Fripp from King Crimson were renowned for not allowing bandmates into the band unless they had the right, right star sign. Mm. And, you know, many have fallen prey to Scientology. I think we have to just accept that the creative mind is a slightly offbeat one. And if they come up, therefore, with weird political opinions as well, well, that's par for the course. If she's a great singer and if she helps us finally to win Eurovision, I don't frankly care what she believes Quite in right. politics. <laughs> because she's not going to influence anyone. David, are you a carpet muncher? I'm afraid not today, no. Because uh, let me tell you that <laughs> research has found that floors and carpets are often neglected during household cleans, <laughs> especially in British bedrooms. Uh, in fact, the carpet in Britain's bedrooms can be dirtier than the toilets. So have carpets in the home become outdated? Uh, what do you think, David, about, about carpets? Is your home carpeted? It is carpeted, it is more over rugged. I, I'm a really great fan of a good thick rug. I think it's a wonderful thing to have on your Show bedroom floor. Show it to me floor. later. Well, particularly on the bedroom floor. It baffles the sound marvellously. And, you know, there's, there's nothing so bad about being in someone else's flat as when they've got blinds and floorboards. The sound bounces everywhere. It's yeah. like <laughs> sitting in an echo chamber. To be in a lovely thick rug room and to feel the enveloping warmth of a proper British carpet and a proper British curtain <laughs> makes me feel proud. So there you go. Are, are carpets, by definition, a British thing, do you think, Neil? I mean, a good wool carpet produced in Axminster, you can't have anything better. And, and with a farmhouse, like I said, with a few drafts in it, um, you actually do need a good carpet. So I think you need a mixture, like all things. I think also, I mean, of course, naturally, you do actually need to clean your carpets. Uh, that's what people forget. And, of course, if you've got a pet as well, the other problem is you sometimes get fleas in the carpet as well. Mm. So it's just a case of keeping that carpet clean. But I think carpets insulate. Um, I think they are a great natural product as long as you don't have a nylon carpet um, but of course you know they are expensive but they're very good Emma begs to differ I, I'm, I'm the carpet free in my house <laughs> um, is that and right? I, I love. Where's this going, Emma? I love my flat. Family show. I, I'm honestly. I walk around. I never have shoes on in my own home. I never ask anyone to take theirs off either. I had this exact conversation yesterday with a friend who came over and immediately took her shoes off. I didn't ask you to do that. I'm not middle class. Leave me alone. I, I'm, I'm lower middle class. I think. I, I, that's I, I always think the, shoe, the shoes off is a little bit snobby. I always find. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if I were carpeted, then I probably would ask people to take their shoes off because that's what but, brings. But, but you're going to say I agree necessary. with you that the, the wood floors, which I've mostly got, are. Mm. Are, are much cleaner. They are, and I'm useless at cleaning, so something I can sweep up easily and yeah. doesn't... I have got a cat, um, as Sky News viewers will know, because she sky-bombed me the other day. Um, <laughs> Is that right? She did, bless her little cotton socks. Um, but she, oh, she does shed, and when she does, it's much easier to clean on, mm. on these wooden floors. Well, if you're very lazy like I am, what you find with the wooden floors uh, is that the, the dust kind of shifts to the edge of the room. Yeah. You just, you just go along <laughs> the, the bottom <laughs> of the wall That's with right. a damp tissue. Yeah. And like the great Quentin yeah. Chris says, after three years, you don't notice it. Yeah. You don't notice You don't <laughs> notice it all. There. But, there you go. Well, we love a bit of colour, don't we? That's why I like the great British pub, by the way. You get a good old carpet down your boozer. And it's sticky. That's what a good pub should be. Uh, the worst thing, though, I grew up with toilet in the bathroom. Uh, sorry, uh, carpet in the bathroom. Yeah. It's stinky. Uh, look, thank you for your company. Really enjoyed the last three days. I'm back on Friday at 8. Headliners is next. Hello there. I'm Greg Dewhurst, and welcome to your latest broadcast from the Met Office. Dry over the next few days as high pressure builds in. We will see plenty of sunny spells by day but chilly at night and then rain later moving in by the middle of the week. This area of high pressure anchored to the east of us, keeping weather fronts at bay generally over the next few days. But they will try and move in as we head towards Wednesday in particular, bringing some wetter and windier weather across the north and the west. Chilly evening out there, we've got clear skies across 
much of the UK, just some thicker cloud around northern and western areas. This will generally keep the frost at bay here, but elsewhere under the clear skies tonight, we'll see temperatures falling close to, if not below freezing, minus two to minus four in the prone spots of northern England and southern Scotland. But that means plenty of blue skies to start the day on Monday morning, a chilly start. You might need to scrape the ice off the car, but that will soon melt away as the sun gets to work and then through the day on Monday, a fine day to come, plenty of sunny spells. Sunshine a bit more hazy though and limited across parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. But temperatures doing quite well, 14 or 15 Celsius in the north and the west, but still chilly along some eastern coast with the breeze coming off the North Sea here. Temperatures falling away again Monday evening under those clear skies. The cloud just thickening across parts of Northern Ireland, western Scotland further as this weather system starts to move in giving a few splashes of rain. But just notice the blues returning back on the map, indicating a frost returning to take us into Tuesday morning. That means again, a sunny start across much of England and Wales, cloudy skies across Northern Ireland, far west of Scotland, to begin Tuesday with some patchy rain and drizzle here. This continues through the day, but elsewhere, plenty of sunny spells. So again, the sunshine just turning hazy further east across parts of Scotland, Northern England into the afternoon. And temperatures not too bad in that sunshine. That wetter weather moving in for Wednesday and Thursday, but temperatures overall a little above average. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. 